Okay, so it's uh, 1130 a.m. here on the West Coast, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. On behalf of the Northwest Mental Health Technology uh, Center, welcome to today's webinar on facilitating recovery and post-traumatic growth with the people we serve. We're so grateful that so many of you could join us to learn more about this important topic. Uh, my name is Dr. Gabriel Orsi, and I am a project manager with the Northwest MHTTC. Uh, first, a little bit about the MHTTC network. It's a nationwide network supported by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Our goals include disseminating and implementing evidence-based practices for mental health issues into the workforce. Other goals include supporting mental health related evidence based practices, heightening the awareness, knowledge and skills of the workforce, fostering regional and national alliances and providing and connecting you with free training and technical assistance. Our area of focus is evidence-based uh, practices for serious mental health issues such as psychosis in HHS Region 10, which is Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. However, we do provide trainings on a variety of topics, including integrated care, suicide prevention, diversity and equity issues, school mental health, peer support, trauma-informed approaches, and more. We'd like to take a, a moment to acknowledge the many cultures and lands in our region and the traditional stewards of those lands. Because it's based in Seattle, the Northwest MHTTC sits on the traditional land of the Duwamish and Coast Salish peoples and we're grateful for their stewardship and care throughout the generations. We would like to talk about language for just a moment. First, to remind you that this webinar is being recorded, so please avoid sharing anything confidential. And second, it's our intention to always be mindful of using language that promotes recovery and culturally appropriate terminology. Um, we emphasize um, and, and encourage person first language to demonstrate respect for a person's dignity and worth, and um, that is consistent with recovery oriented practices. I skipped ahead a little too much, I'm sorry. Um, a few housekeeping items next. Um, we are going to um, ask that you stay muted and your video is off. We just have a large enough audience today that it's it's really difficult to, to participate as fully as you could with a small group. We are recording. We are going to make the recording and the slides available two to four weeks after this presentation. And we are going to offer a certificate of attendance to those uh, folks who attended today. You'll have about a month uh, to download that certificate. Certainly email us if you have any questions about obtaining materials or certificates. Our work um, is supported by SAMHSA and SAMHSA uh, requires us to do an evaluation. Your evaluation is really crucial not only to uh, keep our funding going to provide free trainings like this, but also so that we can incorporate your suggestions and feedback and continually improve. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. If they are questions about the subject matter being presented by our speaker today, please put those in the Q&A box makes it easier for us to keep track of those important questions. Please use the chat box for any technical questions or other types of questions that aren't about the presentation. Our staff is monitoring that chat box and re will respond to you there. Standard disclaimer that I'm afraid I have to, <laughs> to, to share with you, but I promise I will not read this to you. Uh, SAMHSA sponsors this work, but does not take an official position on the content we're sharing here today. And so now on to the important part. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anne-Marie Repka. She's a clinical psychologist, a trainer and consultant based in Seattle, Washington. Her areas of expertise include resilience, well-being, motivation, cognitive behavioral therapies, and the impact of trauma, including both post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic growth. Dr. Repke strives to help people live well in the face of challenging circumstances. She's developed and tested multiple psychosocial interventions. 
um, she's dedicated to using interactive learning approaches to empower professionals um, like our audience today to help others while tending to their own well-being. She earned her doctorate in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania Positive Psychology Center. And she's an active member of the APA, the Society of Consulting Psychology, the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, and she even hosts a podcast. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to our speaker today. Welcome, Dr. Repke. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And thank you to you all for making the time. Um, give me just a moment to share my slides and we'll get going. All right, so welcome to this webinar on facilitating post-traumatic growth and recovery with the people we serve. Before I say anything about that, I want to thank you for that service that you do. Um, it looks from the chat box like we have people from far and wide and people in, in a diversity of different roles and professions, um, but I think the one thing that typically we all have in common, folks that come to these webinars, is that we are all helping professionals in some way. We work in different social services, trying to serve individuals, trying to serve communities. And I know that that work can often be grueling. It can often be emotionally draining, particularly in a year like this. Um, it can often be overworked and underpaid, and it can sometimes be thankless. Um, I don't know how often you hear thanks for your work, but it is almost certainly not often enough because you truly are essential in every meaning of that word. Um, I think that's become really clear this year, if it wasn't clear to people before. Um, and I just really want to thank you for the work that you do to foster growth and recovery and healing in our communities. So I am Anne-Marie Repke. I am really delighted to be here with you to talk about post-traumatic growth. Um, here's the roadmap that I have in mind for our hour together today. We'll talk about what post-traumatic growth is what makes post-traumatic growth more likely to happen? And how can we as helpers potentially do some things to intentionally facilitate people's process of recovery and post-traumatic growth? Um, one more standard disclaimer you'll see at the bottom here. Everything I talk about here will be intended as education and information and not as specific, uh, not, excuse me, not as specific medical advice or healthcare advice um, to you. So you know, if you have questions about the role of trauma or recovery or post-traumatic growth in your own life, definitely check it out with a professional or a healer that you trust. Now, um, before we get rolling with the content, um, something that I have been doing with a lot of my talks and trainings in the past year is just offering an optional and brief grounding practice at the beginning. I know that this is a year where a lot of people are feeling a lot of stress, a lot of burnout, um, and sometimes people appreciate taking a few moments to just slow down and arrive to the space and let go of some of those other demands. So if you'd like to take part, I'll facilitate just a brief mindfulness type of grounding exercise. If you know that that's not for you, no problem at all. You can literally mute me if you want until you see this slide advance. Now, if you do wanna take part, you can go ahead and start out by just getting in as comfortable a position as you're able whether that's seated, standing, laying down, something else. You might close your eyes or you might just gently rest them at a blank spot. And first, just giving yourself a moment to settle in, letting the mind catch up with the body. So often our body's in the here and now and our mind is lingering in the past or dashing off into the future. So we're just perhaps setting an intention to sync those up and just pay attention to the present moment. First, perhaps paying attention to any sounds that you can hear in this moment. Perhaps sounds filtering in from outside perhaps the white noise of your technology and just the sounds and qualities of my voice, just sort of letting those sounds wash over you. And 
And then perhaps bringing that same mindful awareness to the body, noticing all the points of contact or connection where the body's resting on, supported by another surface, such as your chair. Perhaps noticing the feet grounded on the floor. bringing our awareness to the breath, if it serves you. Noticing the movement of the breath in the body. Just looking for any gentle rise and fall. As you breathe in and out, you might be noticing that in the chest, in the belly, even in the sides or back of the rib cage. And in this moment, in this practice, there's no need to fix it, change it breathe any particular way. You're really just watching the body breathe itself for you. And finally, bringing that awareness to the mind itself. Just checking in with ourselves, noticing where you're at right now, what thoughts and feelings are bouncing around. Whatever they are, it's fine. There's no need to banish them. Just simply noticing them the way that we would notice leaves floating by on a stream or clouds floating through the sky. And as we close, just taking a few moments in silence for yourself for whatever you might need, whether that's some other practice, setting an intention, having a moment of prayer that fits with your belief system, or just luxuriating and having a few moments where you don't have to do anything. All right, and as we close, coming back to the body, perhaps moving or stretching in any way that feels right for you, repositioning yourself if you need to, gently opening the eyes if they were closed, coming back together, and we will move forward, speaking about recovery and post-traumatic growth. All right, so... Um, Really, really pleased to be exploring this topic of recovery and post-traumatic growth in particular with you, a very sort of special aspect of recovery. Um, post-traumatic growth is something that's near and dear to me. It's what I spent my doctorate studies really focused on trying to understand what is it that helps some people um, not only get through adversity, but really transform their experience of adversity. What is it about them? How do they do that? What is that process? And what can the rest of us learn from them so that we can try to have those sorts of recovery and growth experiences for ourselves and for those that we care about, for those that we want to help? Um, so that was really my goal is to understand those things when I went to graduate school um, at the University of Pennsylvania. The first thing that I learned um, upon uh, arriving there was that all of Philadelphia um, has this really intense fixation with Benjamin Franklin. Um, everywhere you go, there's Benjamin Franklin paraphernalia. There's life-size statues of him everywhere. There's signs saying Ben Franklin walked here. Ben Franklin sat in this chair and so forth. There's streets named after him. Um, there are cosplayers dressed as him. Um, it's really quite intense. And the University of Pennsylvania campus is no exception. The main walkway of the campus is literally paved in quotes by Ben Franklin, one of which you are seeing here. And this quote from Ben Franklin is, there are no gains without pains, quite relevant to this concept of post-traumatic growth. Now, of course, Ben Franklin, as much as we love him, um, didn't invent this concept, right? He wasn't the first one to comment on this idea that with suffering, there can be some potential for redemption, for transformation, for gains to emerge from this. This is an idea that has come up in philosophy and in different spiritual and religious texts for thousands of years. 
Now, in the last 30 years or so, we've begun to really turn the lens of psychological science on this phenomenon of post-traumatic growth, on this aspect of recovery that is post-traumatic growth. And we've begun to try to use scientific methods to understand what this is about. So this is most often studied and talked about as post-traumatic growth, but you'll also see it called stress-related growth, adversarial growth, benefit finding, altruism born of suffering, referring to those ways in which we become um, more open to others, more caring and empathetic to others, the way that our heart can grow because of our own experience of suffering. So what is this phenomenon of post-traumatic growth in the way that we've studied it scientifically? Well, um, the definition that comes from Tedeschi and Calhoun, who really pioneered this work, is that post-traumatic growth, or PTG, is about positive change that someone experiences as a result of the struggle with a major life crisis or trauma. And I really want to take a moment to virtually underline the word struggle, because the way we're thinking about this, right, is that if growth happens, it's not a direct result of the trauma or crisis. It's not because trauma is directly good for us. We know all of the ways that trauma is deeply harmful and hurtful to us. The growth comes from the person's own struggle, the, the person's own internal work to come to grips with the trauma, to come to grips with the adversity that they have survived. And it's from that internal work that they're doing that there is some potential for this positive change. Now, anytime we're talking about recovery from trauma or growth after trauma, I think it's worthwhile to take a brief moment to unpack what we might mean by trauma. There are, of course, many different ways to define this. Um, I think that sometimes in our culture, we might throw around this term a little bit too casually that doesn't really do justice to the enormity of people's experiences of trauma and adversity. Um, you know, one way to define trauma is to go to the official textbook definition, right? From the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM-5 now, which really defines trauma as actual or threatened death, injury, sexual violation that might happen to you personally or that you might witness or might be happening to someone close to you. Um, and, and absolutely, those experiences of trauma are really important to understand and to consider. And there are many other types of really painful adversity that people may experience as traumatic that don't quite fit into that kind of classic official notion. Um, we can think about the hardships that people might go through, for instance, if they're in a, an emotionally abusive or emotionally neglectful family growing up. We might think about people's experiences of being unhoused or of being incarcerated, uh, people's experiences of racism and discrimination and bias, uh, people's experiences of harms at the hands of systems that are supposedly here to protect us, and all of the many private pains that people may have, like going through a miscarriage or uh, struggling through a family member's experience with mental illness. So I really want to encourage us to think broadly about what is it that we're recovering from? What is it that we might be thinking about opportunities to grow from? Now, when we're talking about post-traumatic growth, it really is a bit different than resilience or recovery. Two other crucial and inspiring topics that I care a lot about. <laughs> and I wish we had 10 hours together so we could unpack all of this. Um, just like there's many definitions of trauma, there's many definitions of resilience and of recovery. Um, but in the, in the science, here's a way that we can distinguish these three different things. Um, I had high hopes that I was going to bring up the Zoom whiteboard and draw you a graph and then realize that it's not possible in the webinar mode. So I'm going to draw you a graph with my words. Um, so imagine that we're going along through our life, right? And we're at whatever level of functioning we're at whatever level of our mental health, whatever level of our ability to connect with others, whatever level of wisdom we're walking around with and so forth. So we're going along and then something happens that really shakes our world, something traumatic, something painful, some sort of crisis. Well, at this moment, right, there's a number of different things could happen. So one thing that could happen is that we might manage through our inner resources, through our external resources, we might be able to manage to go through more or less unscathed 
right? So there may be some bumps, right? There may be some real disruptions in our functioning, but that we're able to kind of weather the storm without too much harm coming from us. And that would be kind of a very classic stereotypical definition of resilience. Now we can absolutely broaden that definition, but we can think of that as a classic resilience trajectory. You're going along, something really bad happens. You hit a few bumps, but you basically manage to weather the storm. A lot of times how recovery is talked about is that you're going along, something really hard happens and it really takes you down for a bit, right? That you really are harmed or hurt by this thing. For example, a trauma happens and you have post-traumatic stress disorder or it sends you into a mental health crisis or into um, struggles with alcohol or substances, right? And then there's a process of, of coming back from that. Now, admittedly a simplistic definition of recovery, but one way that we can think about that path. Now, post-traumatic growth, what this is about is that at the end of this process, you're going along with your level of functioning, this crisis happens, and at the end of it, after you come to grips with that, you are actually up here. So you are at a higher level of functioning in some ways than you were when you started out. You came out of this with what might be called a boon, if you're familiar with the, the hero's journey, right? That you gained something from this experience that you didn't have before. So it's not about going through unscathed, right? And it's not about getting back to where you were or reclaiming what you used to have. It is really about transcending that, transforming that, and gaining something that was not there before. And that's, of course, compatible with resilience. It's compatible with recovery. But that would be the difference, right? Is that there is a gain. Yeah, thank you, um, Will, for this comment, the, the phoenix rising. There are lots of metaphors um, and examples of this that we can see in different literature and spiritual and cultural traditions. So let's talk more about what post-traumatic growth is, what this looks like. And to kick that off, I'd like to ask about your experiences and observations of post-traumatic growth. And Gabrielle, if you would help me out with those polls now, that would be fantastic. So the first question for you all is, have you ever seen examples of post-traumatic growth in yourself, your loved ones, and, your, and or your clients? So have you ever seen examples of this sort of positive change where someone gains something they did not have before because of the way that they struggled to come to terms with trauma or adversity? Thank you so much to all who have weighed in. Leave this up for just a moment more. All right. What do you think, Gabrielle? Should we go ahead and close it? Sure, let's um, end the poll and share out the results. Great, thank you. So really um, quite dramatic results. The vast majority of people, about 88%, have seen examples of post-traumatic growth in their own lives, personally, professionally. Um, about one in 10 of you said, maybe, I'm not sure yet. Um, and one person said, no, I don't think that I have. All right, and the second poll, please. Oh, all right. So here's the second poll. Um, if you care to comment on this, have you experienced any personal growth so far as a result of struggling with COVID or other related stressors from the past year? Are there any ways that your struggle to come to terms with these challenges has resulted in anything that you value. And it is 100% fine if the answer is absolutely not. And thank you to those who have shared additional thoughts on this in the chat. Finding one's voice sounds like quite a powerful change to gain. 
All right. So last call to weigh in on this poll. Great, thank you for sharing. And let's, uh, let's share these results with everyone. So it looks like about 70% of folks say yes, there has been some sort of growth I've experienced. Um, about 13% saying no, no, I haven't. Um, or at least no, not at this time. Um, and 16% saying maybe, perhaps something's starting to emerge a little bit early to tell, or sometimes growth can be quite complicated and complex. It can be kind of braided together with things that are still really painful and difficult, where it can be a little bit hard to tease out what's what, um, perhaps until we have the benefit of, of more hindsight. All right, thank you for your help with that poll and thank you all for weighing in. So it sounds like the vast majority of people have seen some example of post-traumatic growth. For some, it might be in ourselves. For some, it might be in clients or loved ones. Um, I would love to know what that looks like. What have you noticed? If you might go to the chat box and share some examples. What were you thinking of when you filled out that poll and said, yes, I have seen post-traumatic growth? Or perhaps, yes, I've experienced it. Deconstruction and rebuilding of faith structures, boundaries, stronger bonds with loved ones, a deeper awareness of being able to overcome. The sense that nothing will ever be as bad as that, that I can, I can do other things if I can make it through that. Well, it's, it's, um, it's inspiring to me that these are moving so fast that I can't even read them all being able to identify emotions and manage them, knowing my worth, opening up more, following life's passion and finding a purpose, self-awareness, new roles, recalibrating priorities, keeping the mind active. Well, perhaps other things, right? Not as much. And that's very real that there's this dialectic. There can be this paradox where in some ways we might be absolutely um, still struggling in some areas while growing in others. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing these. Yeah, and someone shared the idea of the wounded healer, which might be quite relevant for a lot of us in our roles, right? The idea that by being in touch with our own experiences of suffering and our own ways of healing from that, that it might inform the work that we do, trying to be companions to others on that journey. Thank you so much for sharing these. So everything that you're sharing here in these examples is really consistent with what we see in the scientific literature on post-traumatic growth. So there are five main categories of changes that are really commonly reported. These are not meant to be exhaustive, right? They're not meant to describe everyone's experiences, but these are some of the ones that often pop up. Changes in people's relationships, perhaps being more willing to be open and vulnerable, perhaps having more empathy or altruism for other people, perhaps having deeper connections because of the way that people really showed up for you and that you really opened up to them during this time. A sense of personal strength, what someone had shared in here, that feeling of if I, that, if I made it through that, then I can really make it through a lot. A greater appreciation of life and that recalibration of priorities that someone spoke to. Noticing what really matters and savoring that and letting some of the rest of it go. A sense of new possibilities, that there are new, new roles, new paths, new ways of serving, new activities or hobbies, new ways of uh, maybe creatively or artistically expressing someone's um, inner self. All of these new possibilities that might not have been there before or might have been there, but not been clear that we might've just been turning our eye to, um, but doors that are cracking open, that there might be something interesting behind. And uh, finally, spiritual changes, people saying that they feel they have a deeper, richer spiritual understanding for having grappled with these things. So those are some examples of what post-traumatic growth is. How about what post-traumatic growth is not? 
it's really important to me to note these things up front. So first of all, post-traumatic growth is not a justification for allowing violence, harm, trauma, oppression to be happening. The fact that some people manage to wring some sort of valued change out of that does not mean that it's good for us, right? That it's good for us as individuals or good for us as a society for violence and trauma and harm and abuse and oppression to be happening. Post-traumatic growth is not a reason to forego treatment efforts or prevention efforts, right? Um, None of this is about saying, oh, throw out what we already know about recovery and healing and therapy, and let's just talk about positive growth. No, these are all important parts of the picture. Post-traumatic growth should not be a standard that we hold others to or that we hold ourselves to. I think that's probably one of the least helpful things that we could do if we really want to support someone's process of recovery, healing, and growth it's probably not particularly helpful to tell them you shouldn't be at this point in your recovery. You should be at this place where you are in, uh, an inspiring, transcendent exemplar of post-traumatic growth. This is something that may or may not happen as a result of struggling with a given thing and sometimes just literally surviving an experience and making it out alive is already a massive achievement. And Finally, as we spoke to, post-traumatic growth is not exactly the same thing as resilience or recovery. So who experiences post-traumatic growth? What makes it more likely? Um, that's going to inform our understanding of what we could do to try to cultivate it, right? Whether in ourselves or in other people. Um, so if we just look and see out of the people who are describing a lot of post-traumatic growth, what do they have in common? Um, here are some factors. So first of all, it's actually quite common. Um, the rates differ study to study, and it's a little bit hard to pin a specific percentage on it. The reason being post-traumatic growth is a spectrum of experiences. It's not conceptualized like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, where we go through a diagnostic checklist and we get to decide if someone meets criteria or not. Now, there's a whole other topic about um, whether it's appropriate to think of mental health in those diagnostic bins where it's a binary yes or no decision. Um, I think that really most of these things are a spectrum of experiences. But because we have those bins, people who have PTSD, people who don't have PTSD, we can give a percentage, right, of how many people experience it. Not the same thing with post-traumatic growth and the way that it's been measured and studied. But that said, on average, a about 60% of people in the research will say that they've experienced at least a, a moderate extent of post-traumatic growth as a result of a crisis or trauma that they went through. So it's not particularly rare. What else makes it more likely? Who is experiencing PTG? Well, it's often people who are suffering more. So um, I think it can be tempting to look at these things in an oversimplified way where we say, okay, a bunch of people go through trauma. There are people who are really, really struggling. There are people who are resilient. And then there are people who are just growing from it. Fantastic for them. Well, one thing that's problematic about that is that a lot of times the people who are growing from the same, from the experience are the same people who are really struggling with the experience. So there's actually a relationship between, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms or other distress, where people who experience more distress are more likely to report post-traumatic growth up to a point. So people who have really, really, really high levels of distress who are really struggling, that's not typically a situation, at least at that time, that's conducive to growth because you're putting all your resources right into just surviving this. Um, at the same time, though, people who are reporting very, very, very uh, low levels of distress, people who say, yeah, I guess that experience looked really bad from the outside, but um, it, it didn't really get to me that much. Well, they're also less likely to experience post-traumatic growth, which makes sense, right? Because normally when experiences aren't really shaking us, 
we can get very busy just maintaining all the other things in daily life and not doing this deep reflection and this deep struggle that seems to be related to the growth process. And finally, who experiences post-traumatic growth? What makes it more likely? Well, um, people with certain traits and people with certain experiences and people with certain habits and coping styles. So in a moment, I'm going to show you my favorite slide I've ever made because I'm a big nerd and I'll, I'll explain to you why it's my favorite slide. But first, I want to get your observations or your hunches. What do you think are the types of either personality traits, experiences, coping styles, et cetera, that tend to be related to experiencing post-traumatic growth? You can um, share those in the chat. What have you noticed or what, what would be your hunches? Gratitude. Um, broken heart, creativity, openness to experience. That is indeed a personality trait that has been linked to this. Um, positivity, perspective taking, strong relationships, initiative. There's in fact a construct called personal growth initiative, which refers to being that sort of person who's always on the lookout for ways to improve oneself. And that is indeed linked to post-traumatic growth. Um, we have more um, items coming in here through the chat. Yeah. There is a question um, that someone posted to the question and answer a question here. Oh, great. Me. Let's hear it. Um, she says, are these individuals that have also been diagnosed with PTSD and then they mm -hmm. experience um, the post-traumatic growth? Yeah. So there's really interesting questions about the timeline. So first of all, yes, there are absolutely studies where people concurrently have a diagnosis of PTSD and are reporting post-traumatic growth. So at first glance, that might seem counterintuitive in a way, but let's think about what that could look like, right? Perhaps someone is still absolutely experiencing nightmares about their traumatic experience, um, that they're still having lots of intrusive memories about it, um, that they might still be hypervigilant, that they might not let people sit at their back, right? That they might jump at noises. And at the very same time, they feel closer to their loved ones than ever before because of the way that select people have really been there for them. They feel more willing to be vulnerable and open with people instead of trying to go it on their own. Um, they feel that they have realigned their priorities, that they actually see a new path that they want to either perhaps help other people who have gone through something like this. Um, I think, for instance, I've met a lot of um, really remarkable folks working in peer support and peer coaching roles who have that sort of survivor mission. Um, or perhaps it's not necessarily that, but they see a new path like, gosh, I, I just have realized how short and frail life is, and I want to really go make the most of it and do these things that used to terrify me. So these two things can be happening at once, right? Now, in terms of the, the time course, right, of PTSD and post-traumatic growth, uh, a lot more research needs to happen before we understand the interplay of the distress and the growth over time. What we do know is that in the first year or two after a trauma, those things tend to um, be more positively correlated where there's more distress and more growth happening. After you get about a year and a half or two years out, they tend to be less correlated. So for instance, people's distress may be falling away and the growth is remaining or the people who have the greatest growth have the lower distress at that point. Um, more we could say about that, but I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah, so thank you so much for sharing these observations and, and hypotheses about people who are more likely to experience post-traumatic growth. A lot of these are ones that do show up in the literature. Now, I will show you my favorite slide. It is gonna be way less impressive um, than, you, than you might expect, but the reason that um, the nerd in me loves this slide is what you're seeing is the bigger font sizes are the things that are more strongly associated with growth in the literature. So bigger words, bigger effects here. So what you can see, right, is that people who cope with adversity by doing things like trying to find some way to reappraise it and reframe it for themselves so that it's less threatening and more promising, that positive reappraisal coping stronger relationship. People who cope through turning to their religion and their, their spiritual faith, more likely to report growth. People who have a lot of good social support and who cope by turning to their people, more likely to experience growth. People who are optimistic, people who cope through acceptance instead of sort of trying to box with reality, more likely to experience growth. Um, 
Now you might also notice down toward the bottom of the screen, an interesting one that shows up here, um, coping through denial, more related to describing post-traumatic growth experiences. Um, there is a huge controversy amongst post-traumatic growth researchers about to what extent people's own reports that they've grown through trauma um, are 100% accurate. Or if for some people, some part of that insistence that like, no, I've really grown from this might be kind of a coping strategy of trying to convince ourselves it's not that bad, it's not that bad, I'm getting something good out of it. And, and in some ways, maybe not being willing um, to fully experience or acknowledge the awfulness and pain of some of these experiences. So there is a huge controversy, a huge methodological controversy about um, what people's own descriptions of post-traumatic growth mean. So certainly there's a lot of innovation and improvement we still need to do in the way that we study this and the way that we um, sort of get this information. But I know I, for one, absolutely believe that post-traumatic growth is a real phenomenon as it seems that, that most of you do um, as well. So while we do need to improve some of our methods for understanding um, what these reports are and understanding the way that some of these different coping styles, including acceptance, including denial, including positive appraisal, we need to understand more about how those come into play. Um, and let's see, I'm seeing a message in the chat about conscious, respectful language. And I wonder if there is um, anything that I've said just now that didn't feel respectful. If so, I, I want to do better. So would welcome knowing that. Yes, the person had commented through the chat um, to be conscious of using the word crazy when describing. And I um, don't have the exact context in which it was used, but that was her comment. Oh, okay. Just please be thoughtful um, okay. about the words that we choose um, when we're speaking. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you for that. And I, I appreciate that in this professional community that we're a part of, I know we're all always striving better, um, striving to do better in these ways of being person-centered um, and being tuned into respect and to equity and so forth. So um, yeah, I appreciate that we can all hold each other to that. Um, all right, so these are some of the factors that are associated with post-traumatic growth. And I'll tell you the other reason that I really love this is that all of these factors that you see, they are for the most part changeable. These are dynamic, right? These are not things like, well, the year that you were born in, determines if you are likely to experience post-traumatic growth. And in fact, what we see is that things like that, things like age, um, things like sort of demographic factors tend to have quite small relationships with post-traumatic growth. And it is these sorts of dynamic things, such as coping styles, such as your level of social support, that really tend to be more closely related to growth. And so I find that to be really encouraging because it means that we can potentially make the potential for post-traumatic growth more likely because these things that are linked to it are things that are changeable. So that brings us to our final question, our final topic of, well, how can we facilitate post-traumatic growth? Assuming that we believe it's a real thing and assuming that we think it's good, that it's a good part of recovery, um, well, then how could we facilitate it? Well, I alluded to this controversy, right, in the research world about what do we really know about post-traumatic growth? How real is it and so forth? Um, there's also a lot of controversy about this question of should we be trying to foster post-traumatic growth? And I think that's a good question. I think it's something that we don't want to rush into um, without really reflecting and thinking it through because I think there's the potential to do harm. Um, so it's a good question to say, should we be trying to do this work to foster post-traumatic growth? I think some better questions are, when should we be trying to do it? For example, if someone just went through a traumatic experience yesterday, is today the time to be talking about post-traumatic growth? It's probably going to depend person to person, but for the most part, I'm going to guess, no, there's probably a time and place for it that's probably not the first 24 hours, Right. I think another better question is with whom should we be trying to foster, foster post-traumatic growth? This is going to fit with some people's individual or cultural values and not with others. Um, it might be more relevant 
for some people than others, depending on how well they're coping or how much they're currently struggling. So for example, we spoke about how if people have really extreme levels of distress and PTSD symptoms that they're still grappling with, um, that might not be the right for this time to introduce this. Now, on the other hand, right, this is all very individual. We want to be person-centered. Maybe that's exactly what that person needs to hold on to hope. The idea that this growth is still possible for them and the knowledge that in fact, people who have suffered more are often more likely to experience growth. But this is something we want to be thoughtful about, right? Another better question is how, assuming that we want to aim to foster or cultivate post-traumatic growth, how do we go about that? Which I'll speak to in a moment. And another question is what risks and what benefits might there be? to including some sort of post-traumatic growth focus in our work with people. So I'm going to propose to you, um, based on the scientific literature, the clinical literature, and my own um, clinical experiences, that there are three main ways that we might facilitate post-traumatic growth. Um, you may have additional ways that I haven't thought of, so please um, keep those coming if you do. Um, but one way will be to gently, curiously, respectfully explore the possibility for growth. A second way will be to increase facilitative factors. We'll speak to that in a moment. And a third will be to use specific interventions. So let's unpack each of these three ways. First, what does it mean to do this sort of gentle, curious, respectful exploration? Um, I really like the way that Tedeschi and Calhoun, two of the pioneers in this field, talk about this. They use the phrase expert companion. The idea being that um, while people are on this journey of recovery, this journey of healing, this journey potentially of growth, um, we don't want to try to grab the wheel and jerk it out of the person's hands and say, we're going to growth town, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Um, no, it's much more helpful if we are a companion on that journey, a companion who certainly has certain expertise, right, in methods of helping professionals or perhaps expertise in post-traumatic growth. Um, but we're perhaps uh, emphasizing the companion part of expert companion more than the expert part of expert companion. So can we be gentle, person-centered, meet the person where they're at, and not tell them they need to go somewhere else? that they need to go to this land of post-traumatic growth, but perhaps just inquiring if that's somewhere that they've heard of, inquiring if that's somewhere they've ever been before, inquiring if that's somewhere that they might be interested in thinking about going. So what does this look like? Well, um, one way that this can look is to um, lean on and slightly repurpose some of the counseling and communication skills that we already have for other purposes. So in this case, I'm gonna talk about the clinical micro skills from motivational interviewing, the ORs. And I'm wondering how many of you are um, trained in motivational interviewing or consider yourselves MI practitioners? Great, we're seeing a lot of hands being raised, at least awesome. five people have raised their hands and many more are saying in the chat that they are either trained or they use concepts from it. Fantastic, so um, many of you then are familiar with these ORs, um, which stands for open-ended questions, affirmations of people's strengths, people's good qualities, people's hard work, uh, reflections or reflective listening statements where we're mirroring back what we heard, sometimes perhaps with a little bit of a reframing, um, and summaries. And by summaries, I don't just mean repeating back everything that someone said in a half-hour conversation, but these really thoughtful, intentional summaries, a sort of bouquet that we're handing back to them of things they've said, where we're emphasizing certain flowers in that bouquet arrangement. So, you know, in motivational interviewing, um, the way that we use the ORs is to sort of row the conversation forward, right? Um, to move the conversation forward toward change talk, toward motivation to make a positive change in life. Um, and, right, ORs are also useful for steering. So we can kind of steer 
um, and propel the conversation forward. Well, we can use these same sorts of communication tools to discuss post-traumatic growth, right? To ask open-ended questions about, you know, how there, uh, you know, it, I know that you've been going through a lot of struggle and a lot of pain, and there are so many ways that this has harmed you. And I'm wondering if there are, in addition, any sort of changes you've noticed that are more welcome. And just seeing what someone wants to do with that. And if they say, no, there are absolutely not, okay, then maybe we're dropping it, at least for the time, right? But providing these invitations, um, affirming people. It can be so easy, right, when we are going through painful times to completely discount and lose sight of the good things that we do and the good qualities that we have. Um, the part of trauma, um, just like part of depression, uh, can be really taking on a sense of blame or shame for either what's happened or how a person has coped with it. So really highlighting this person's good qualities, the steps and the strides this person has made, um, and affirming maybe anything that you have seen in them, some, some strength that perhaps is more prominent now. Um, so really kind of holding up a mirror to those. And reflective listening and summaries, right? When the person brings up themes of growth, when they say something like, you know, I hate that this happened and I would trade anything to undo it, you know, but I got to say, if I made it through this, <sighs> I mean, all this other stuff we used to talk about in therapy six months ago, I don't give a damn anymore about that. I mean, if I survived this thing. So if they say something like that, wow, can we really be invested? And can we really treat that just as seriously as we treat what they say about their distress and, and, and really reflect that back? Um, as a gentle invitation for them to expand on it. All right, so as we do this gentle, respectful, curious exploration of opportunities for growth, um, let's reflect together about some helpful and some unhelpful things to say in that exploration. Um, so first of all, what are some things that you might not want to say? if you are trying to discuss post-traumatic growth with a client or perhaps with a loved one, um, what are some things that might um, backfire, things that might be invalidating, that might make the person feel bad about where they're at, that might make the person feel pressured that they are supposed to be growing? Things like, you have to move on. Why did you do that? Yeah, you should. Yeah, you should really look for opportunities to grow. You should really, you know, use this as an opportunity to think about your priorities. It's not as bad as you think. Um, this is only a bump in the road. I understand exactly what you're going through. So-and-so is able to get through it. Yeah, other people have it worse. It gets it. And we can absolutely see, right, the good intentions behind these things, the way that they are meant to be comforting or inspiring or encouraging. Well, look at how so-and-so got through it. Look to their example and do what they did. Well, for some people that might be inspiring and wonderful, but for a lot of people, it might make them feel that much worse about the fact that they haven't been that transcendent example that everyone looks to. Yeah, so any sort of minimizing, any sort of you need to, you have to, you should. Absolutely. Um, so now that we've gotten those out of our system, how about the more helpful things to say? Again, if we're trying to be very gentle, very respectful, make sure that there's no pressure, invalidation, minimizing, but we want to open the door to a conversation about post-traumatic growth. What are some things we might ask or things we might say to someone? I love that. Thank you for sharing that with me. How does it feel talking about this? Yeah, lots of validation. How have you managed so well? What a great strengths-based question that is going to pull for the person talking about their strengths, their internal resources, their coping strategies, the things that they have learned along the way from this hardship or from previous hardships. We've got a related question in the Q&A. Oh yeah, let's hear it. Um, the question is, how would you make sure that the language with this approach doesn't seem to push an unequal power dynamic of being an expert companion with a client? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So um, I think that a lot of interventions that we have um, that are very effective and great interventions um, have a lot of psychoeducational components and skill building components. And I, I offer a lot of those interventions. A lot of my training is as a cognitive behavioral therapist. So I absolutely think there's a time and a place for psychoeducation and for skill building. Now, those are activities where we are firmly ensconced in expert role, right? I have some information or some skills and I will now give it to you. And there are certainly ways that we can um, decrease that power differential a little bit, right? Like teaching those skills or giving that information in a motivational interviewing style. And yet it still does have this set of roles um, where one person is kind of in the expert chair and one person is in this sort of lower position of needing to be helped, taught, and so forth. Um, so in the interventions that I've personally developed and worked on, um, trying to create opportunities for post-traumatic growth, my preference has been to take a much lighter touch and not really use psychoeducation and not really use skill building, right? Two things that often we rely on. Um, and instead going to that more, am I person-centered humanistic sort of style of really asking questions about the person's own expertise. Questions like, how is it that you've managed this? Or what advice would you give to someone else who is coping with this? Things where we really are honoring and, and uplifting their expertise and really downplaying ours and really withholding um, our well-intended advice and, and withholding our skill building perhaps in those conversations or in those moments. Now that doesn't mean we can never do skill building therapy approaches with them, right? Um, but when we are having these post-traumatic growth conversations, really asking questions that center the person's own expertise. Um, and let's see, I'm seeing some things in the chat box. Um, as a peer counselor, I always rephrase whatever I hear. Um, whenever I hear I'm your client, patient, et cetera, we're peers. I'm here for support while you do the work for your journey. I love that. Yeah, I, I imagine that peer counselors would have a lot of wisdom to share with us about this, right? Emphasizing the companion and not the expert. Um, there's a really beautiful metaphor about this in acceptance and commitment therapy. It's called the two mountains metaphor that maybe folks have heard. Um, and I, I sometimes share this metaphor, right? With clients that I work with. And the idea is this, um, we're both humans going through our lives. And it's sort of like we're both climbing our own individual mountains, right? And there may be times that I can look from my mountain that I'm halfway up over to your mountain that you're halfway up. And I can just see from my perspective that if you just reached a little bit up to the right, there's a really good handhold there. And the reason that I know that it's not because I'm smarter than you, right? Or I'm better than you at climbing mountains. You might actually be quite better at climbing mountains. Um, in this case than I am, but it's that with the benefit of this perspective, this vantage point that I have over here from my mountain, I can see things you can't and, and vice versa. Um, and I think that that's another nice way to think about trying to address this inherent power differential. All right. So for the sake of time, I might go ahead and move us forward. Really love these thoughtful questions. Um, so that was the first approach to fostering growth, right, was to have these gentle, respectful, exploratory conversations. Now, the second way is to increase facilitative factors. And all I mean by that is we can look back at this stuff that seems to be associated with growth, that seems to predict growth and say, well, can I help someone with that thing, right? Like we know that social support is really helpful for both post but for recovery and healing in general, so gosh, can I do something to help build up their social support? A, can I be part of that social support for them? And B, can I perhaps help them in connecting more with other people and getting that social support elsewhere? Or if they are leaning on coping styles that aren't working for them, like avoidance-based coping, well, can I help them do some of more of what we'd call approach-based coping, right? Um, things like coping through, for instance, positive reappraisal, um, solving the problems rather than avoiding them and, and so forth. Um, optimism we see here, right? Are there, again, gentle, respectful, not overly heavy handed ways that we can help the person to address some of their thinking patterns that tend to be very dark and pessimistic 
and try to kind of help them get more cognitive flexibility so that they can at times look at things in a little bit more hopeful, optimistic way. So we can use all of the great therapy skills and helping skills and coaching skills and conversation skills that you all already have and apply here. So basically anytime that you're helping people gain social support or cope more effectively, you may also be increasing the likelihood that they'll be experiencing post-traumatic growth. Um, you know, sometimes people will ask, you know, if I have a loved one who's just gone through a trauma, like what can I do to help them experience post-traumatic growth? You know, and I think that with those cases, sometimes the most helpful thing we can do is not tell them about what promotes growth, but just be the things that promote growth, right? Instead of telling them like, well, social support is going to be really important. Just show up and be providing that social support instead of telling them, you know, well, people who experience post-traumatic growth, you know, um, really often like learn a lot about how wonderful people are. This is one of the items that's often endorsed. Well, why don't we just give them evidence of how wonderful people can be in the aftermath of them seeing how terrible people can be by just really showing up in those kind and generous and loving ways. So I don't think we have to over complicate it in some sense. We can be there and show up with that wise, loving support that you would be bringing anyway. And knowing that a lot of those same factors that foster general recovery, healing, well being, and mental health also foster growth. And now finally, we said that the third approach to fostering post-traumatic growth are specific interventions. So I want to allude to a few that have research evidence behind them. Um, so some interventions that have been shown to be helpful are writing-based interventions. So there's a classic form of writing called expressive writing. It was pioneered by James Pennebaker, and it's what it sounds like. It is sitting down for, say, 30 minutes and just writing your deepest thoughts and feelings about what happened to you and how it's affected you. Not holding back, not worrying about the spelling, not worrying about the punctuation, but just sort of letting it out. And that has been uh, linked to post-traumatic growth. Um, some colleagues and I did a variant of this that we called prospective writing um, because it's writing about the future. Um, so my graduate advisor, Marty Seligman, has done a lot of work about the way that our future thinking impacts us and our well-being. Um, so this type of writing is um, a little bit more structured. And the idea is to, again, just kind of direct people's attention toward any opportunities they might see for growth, not telling them that they've got to do it or here's how. But essentially, the prompt for this writing exercise is to say, um, sometimes when some people go through adversity, they find that there are great losses and pains um, and it feels like many things that have been important to them are slipping away, that certain doors are closing. Um, and sometimes people also find that over time, they might notice other doors starting to open that hadn't been there before, now that their life is changing. Have you noticed any such changes, any doors opening, any such opportunities? please write about this for 15 minutes. Um, and we found that this was also helpful for people in these domains of post-traumatic growth. Um, in addition, we know that therapy in general helps with post-traumatic growth. So um, uh, a while back, I did a study where I, I combed through the literature and found every randomized controlled trial that had been done to assess whether different types of therapy promote post-traumatic growth? Um, and the answer is yes. And it wasn't just one specific type of therapy. So there's evidence for cognitive behavioral therapies. There's evidence for stress management programs. There's evidence for mindfulness training. There's evidence for something called narrative exposure therapy, which is also cool because there are different culturally adapted versions. It's um, quite versatile to be used with, within different cultural contexts. Um, and there are therapies specifically designed to talk about post-traumatic growth and to target post-traumatic growth. But what's fascinating to me is that even if we're not purposefully 
targeting it, even if we're not ever using the term post-traumatic growth, uh, even if we're just focused strictly on the recovery and the healing process itself, that often people are gaining post-traumatic growth from that process. So you are probably already fostering post-traumatic growth, even if you were not naming it with those terms. All right, so um, as we close here, um, I have two questions for you all, um, if you would be willing to share in the chat box. One is just, what is one takeaway for you from what we've discussed today? Um, perhaps a bit of information or a term or a thought or an idea that stood out to you. Something surprising, something perhaps you hadn't known, something that caught your attention. Thanks for sharing these, what PTG is and is not, the difference from resilience or recovery, the journaling ideas. Mm, the timing is so important, absolutely. Mm, just knowing that this growth is possible. A conversation companion, that is really lovely. Helpful and unhelpful things to say. Yeah, don't insist on growth, but ask about it. Yeah. And let me give you this other um, question while you're reflecting as well. Um, you might choose to share with us one thing you're curious to learn more about that came up today. Narrative exposure therapy. Mm, don't be an expert all the time. Narrative exposure therapy. Yeah. The social support linked to post-traumatic growth. Mm, how to work with clients who might not be enthusiastic about doing trauma counseling. Um, that's something that I think is um, interesting and promising about this topic, right? So I do want to reiterate that I don't think that we should be focusing on PTG at the expense of um, people's other needs, right? People's post-traumatic stress or people's depression or people's distress. Now that said, as one of you just pointed out, sometimes people are really not willing to do trauma-focused therapy for their PTSD, but might this be another way to engage them in talking about their experiences in a way that might feel less threatening and might perhaps help open them up to doing further work. Um, wanting to learn more about the journaling options. Yeah, so the slides will be made available and then you can check out the um, citations I had there. James Pennebaker, I'll put his name here in the um, chat. You can look up his expressive writing and then I had the citation for the prospective writing. You can get that journal article and um, it has the writing prompt in it. If you don't have subscription access um, to journals, feel free to email me and I'm happy to send you that um, journaling prompt um, for one or for both of those. Um, so this is a good time for me to share some resources for further learning. So if you are eager to learn more about this post-traumatic growth stuff, there's some great books out in particular. You can read the books from um, Tedeschi and Calhoun who pioneered a lot of this work. Here's a link to a YouTube lecture by Dr. Tedeschi. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me with questions or like I said, if you want journaling prompts, et cetera. Um, I'm going to also be putting a tab on my website where I'm going to provide some of these types of resources there. Um, and as Gabrielle mentioned, I do have a, a podcast um, last year when everyone was coming together trying to think how can we support each other with this pandemic. Um, I thought, well, maybe something I can do to try to pitch in and do my part is share some of the things that science knows about resilience and recovery. Um, and so I do have a uh, uh, podcast episodes that talk about some of these types of resilience skills. All right. Well, so let me end where I began, which is thanks to you all for your work. Um, I don't know if you've heard this quote before, but when I heard it, it really uh, moved me. Anyone who willingly enters into the pain of a stranger is truly a remarkable person. And I know that is so much of what you do willingly entering into other people's pain. Um, and I just want to thank you for what you do for healing for our communities. So with that, um, Gabrielle, I'll turn it back over to you. 
Um, thank you so much to you and to MHTTC for inviting me to be part of this time. Um, I want to thank the research collaborators I've worked with, um, along with my advisor, Martin Seligman. Um, thank you all for your engagement. Um, and yes, please feel free to reach out if I can send you any resources, information, or anything else. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Repke. So we've got some questions in the Q&A, um, and I think they're basically kind of in sync with the presentation's order. So there's a question about um, what difference differentiates religious coping from spirituality. Mm. Yeah, so um, I'd have to look at exactly what measures they used in those studies. But typically, um, when they're talking about religious coping, it's a little bit more um, structured and maybe associated with your specific religious rituals, for instance, um, you know, going to church services, connecting with other people from your faith, um, praying in your faith tradition, and spirituality is often talked about in a more expansive way that can include people who don't identify with those formal religious structures. But again, I'd have to look for each of those studies that exactly how they ask the questions or operations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So another question, has there been research into the epigenetics and, and its relationship to PTG? It's a great question. I have not seen any of that research um, come out yet. For folks who um, might not be familiar with that term, really, really exciting area of research on mental health in general. The idea is that we're all walking around with certain genes in our DNA, right? Um, and you could think of it almost like walking around with certain piano keys. Um, but there's a difference between just having those piano keys and those piano keys being played, right? So the idea is that we're walking around with these genes, um, but then certain experiences that we go through will sort of activate those genes, play that piano, right? For better or for worse. Um, and so for instance, a lot of um, research on epigenetics is talking about how we are walking around with certain genetic vulnerabilities to, for example, PTSD, depression, or so forth. And then it can be exposure to trauma or other life events that actually activates those. Um, it's a great question about if, um, if there is relevance of that to PTG. I have not seen that research at this point. It's possible that it's out there and I haven't bumped into it. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so there's also some more questions about kind of religion and religiosity. Um, and is there a need for religion or religiosity, or is it just a correlation? Mm, yeah, so definitely not a need for it. It's a correlation. And um, to get a little bit into the weeds about the methodology, um, the way that post-traumatic growth is usually studied is people take this 21 item questionnaire that says, have you grown in these ways as a result of struggling with your experience? And um, several of the questions on there, I think it's two questions, are specifically about having spiritual growth. So it makes sense, right, that if people are endorsing spiritual and religious growth, that then spiritual and religious coping or religiosity would be linked to that, right? Um, but there are absolutely totally secular forms of post-traumatic growth where you're saying, no, I didn't necessarily experience any spiritual changes, I'm either just as religious or just as non-religious as I ever was, but I have this deep appreciation for my life. I have a lot more empathy and altruism for other people and more willingness to be vulnerable. Um, I have a new sense of, of priorities and directions that I'm going to move in. And so you can absolutely experience all of that without religion or spirituality ever being in the picture. Yeah. Great. And I think we have time for maybe one final, final question about denial um, do we want to break through denial? Isn't that dangerous? Mm. Oh gosh, what a um, rich and deep question uh, to try to end on in a, in a 30 second response. Um, here's my take in, in, in short. I think that in the old school coping literature, there was a lot of focus on what's the best coping style. Um, is it approach coping or avoidance coping? Is it problem solving? Is it acceptance? Is it whatever? Um, and I think what we're seeing now in that literature is a focus on the benefits of coping flexibility, the benefits of being able to draw on the right strategy at the right time, the benefits of having a toolbox that is full of different tools. 
And yeah, I think that for some of us in some moments, there's absolutely a time and a place to say, I can't even right now, I need to block this out right now, or I need to distract myself right now. Um, And there's some interesting literature on post-traumatic growth about um, deliberate rumination as a coping style that can be useful to come into the picture at some point. So there's a distinction made between the sort of intrusive rumination of PTSD, which is my trauma keeps coming to my mind and I hate it and I don't want it there and I'm trying to push it away, but I can't push it away versus deliberate rumination, which is a thoughtful reflection of saying, you know what, I need to sit down. I'm ready now to really think through this and talk through this and come to grips with this. And there's a thinking that the shift from that intrusive rumination to that deliberate rumination can be a really helpful process in post-traumatic growth. Wonderful. Well, um, just a final reminder um, to folks that your feedback is critical to our work. And we've shared the link uh, to our survey. Um, Zoom will also send you a follow-up reminder for this evaluation. You'll hear from us in two to four weeks when we post the recording and the slide deck and any other resources that our presenter would like to share. Um, Feel free to connect with us. We're on social media channels. We're on um, the web, obviously, at our website. And we have a newsletter as well. Thank you very much for joining us today and our sincere thanks to our presenter, Dr. Anne-Marie Ripke. We hope to see you at another webinar of ours soon. So be sure to subscribe to our newsletter, check our website or follow us on social media to stay in the loop. Again, it was our pleasure to have you today and thank you to our audience and our presenter. Wonderful, thank you so much, Gabrielle and, and thank you all.